2011, George Barna. You guys know who George Barna is? He does like Gallup. He does big polls, particularly for people of faith. And in 2011, he published what he said it was, it was his most difficult poll he had ever done, most comprehensive. It took him six years to put it together. They personally called over 15,000 people to get a handle on it. It's all about where are you in, they're trying to look at North America and the United States, say where are, as a people, are we in our faith? And as you look at that, if you go to that next slide, Mike, there's a, we'll start with this. And if you see those little things up on top, that gives you an idea. But, you know, I think that's a little hard to read. I want to do something a little different with this. It's all about how do we live out our life in faith. So I need ten volunteers up here. Come on up. Stand across here, if you would. I, um, I need ten, just ten people. It'll be fun. I promise I won't embarrass you. I promise. I just need, I need bodies to hold signs. So as you guys are coming up, I'm going to have you stand up on top there. The reason why this is a big deal, we live in a time right now where people are asking really hard questions. Is there anything in faith? Is this faith stuff really matter? And I really want us to look at this for just a little bit. And I, I think these are more fun than, I think these are a lot more fun than the, uh, <laughs> the graph I showed you. Let me, but let me walk you through what this means. This is a picture of the United States. I know it's about, what, 13 years old now, 12 years old, but it's basically this same way right now. Let's start here. According to Barna's research, 1% of our population says they're unaware of sin. 1%. He said, one thing I found is generally anybody who got out of elementary school realizes there's such a thing as sin, okay? And that's not a lot of people. But next to this, indifferent to sin. Would you believe 16% of our people in, don't care? They know what they're doing isn't right, they don't, but it doesn't bother them at all. And I, I think if you watch television at all, you know what I'm talking about, right? Now, another big group is worried about sin. They may or may not have some connection with a church, maybe a spouse who goes to church or a, a, you know, a mom or dad goes to church. But they're worried about it, but they're not, they have no idea what to do with their sin. But I want you to think about something. This is 57% of our, of our world, our world right now. The people you work with, the people you go to school with, the people that are around you are in this category right now. Nearly everyone we see on a regular basis are, are probably in one of these two places. Okay? Now... I'm going to make it easy for you guys. You three, go ahead and just lay those down there. I'm going to have you guys sit down. Now, forgiveness, forgiven from sin, thank you guys. Forgiven from sin means these people have come to a place in their life, they confess their sins, and they accept Jesus. According to Barna, we had about 9% of the population there, and... Forgive and act. You know, but what he found in all of his research, generally in churches, when someone came forward and said, I want to believe in Jesus, I put my life in his hands, they immediately said, where can we put you to be active? What can you do? We want to sign you up right now. And that's what most people get stuck in. This is called Justification. When someone makes a decision for Christ, either, either you know Jesus or you don't know Jesus. There's no middle ground here, guys. These people know Jesus, but what they did, they stopped here with that and just now they're living out their faith, hanging on to that, but they don't see any different way of living. Okay? And unfortunately, people ask me all the time, why doesn't the church have more impact in this world? Why don't we care for people? How come the poor are hungry? How come people who need health care aren't getting help? Why don't our kids get tutored? Why are, why are seniors lonely? This shouldn't be. You're right. But when we, stuck, when we get stuck here, nothing changes. We just keep living our lives, but I've got fire insurance now. 
I still remember I was in, I was in, I went to Sunday school as a kid. I can still remember in fourth grade, my Sunday school teacher said, she looked right at me because that was the first time I had visited that church. She said, do you have fire insurance? I didn't know how to answer that question. I, I said, I, I think my dad does. <laughs> All right. Kent and Rick, you guys will put yours down there. Now, I'm going to have you guys move up here a second. What Barna found, and the first people who just stood up, that's 89% of our world. They either are living in sin or there's a group that, another, what is it, another 35% know they're saved, know they come to know Jesus. And that's 89% of our population. The people we work with, the people we go to school with, we, we live next door. But he said, here's the difference. These next five, and he found 10 stops that people look at to, to move forward in their faith. But as a general rule, most Christians stopped with knowing Jesus and being active in the church. But what's funny is, if I mean ironic funny, this next five is where lives are changed. You with me? The next five are where lives are changed. Let's, let's look at this. First, we have holy discontent. A lot of people have been Christians a long time, and they come and, and they get, they, they, they've done all the right stuff, they're reading their Bible, and they look at me and say, Jeff, is there anything more? <laughs> this is a, I just feel bored. Is there anything more? Do you realize this holy discontent is what God puts into his children when they have settled for less than they should have. I can tell you, I've been there. I, and you suddenly realize there's got to be more than just the things we keep doing. This takes, this is 6% of all, all the people he interviewed. 6%. But the holy discontent, though, leads you to this. And I didn't choose these people who changed the sides. So there's no, I'm not doing that to anybody. But unfortunately, you do know about this one. You get broken by God. The researcher indicated that in order to, to move closer to, to closer to where God wants you, a person must be broken of three things. Three things. Sin. Second, self. And third, Society. It isn't that God doesn't love you. He does. But he will help you see what you put between him and you. But only 6% of all those talk to get here. Which lead us to surrender and submission. This is really radical dependence. And he only found 1% of the whole populations here. Now we talk about it. He leadeth me. You know, all the hymns, all the praise songs. I will go with Jesus wherever he leads me. Unless he leads me there. Or there. Or there. <laughs> I want you to think about that. 1% get here. See, the, the truth is, most everything up to here is I'm still in control. I believe in Jesus, and I've invited him to be part of my life, but I haven't changed my life much. When I start going here, I'm saying, well, Lord, maybe there's something more. Oh, my gosh, you mean I have to, there's some things I'm not supposed to do, can't do? i gotta, I got to give up a few things. That, uh, you mean it's not about I can't be in control anymore? I, I want to, you see what's going on here? It's about me. And there's a point to where you have to say, okay, Lord, do you remember the old story about the, the guy at the house and, and you invite Jesus in and you let him come into the front, uh, you let him come to your front step and then you let him come into the foyer and that's just real good. Jesus is in my house, he's just, he's in. But after a while he comes to me and says, do you know, Jeff, you got some closets that, are, that need cleaning out? You got, to, you got an attic that needs to be fixed. You got, uh, you got some stuff up there. And there's uh, maybe a basement that's full of stuff. That's a testimony. 
And there comes a point where I say, Lord, I don't want you visiting here. I want you to have the whole house. And I pass over the deed to him and say, it's yours. I'm going to live here with you. That's what this is about. But only 1% go here. And I want you to look at the goals. Do you ever wonder what Jesus' goals are for you? A lot of times we think, I think, you know, I want bells, whistles, and horns. You know, I want the light. No, don't you dare do it. I want, you know, I want the spotlights and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Some days, I'm, I don't really. But I want the stuff, you know. What if I told you God's rewards for you is to learn how to profoundly love God? And this is a re- there's a reason why this is 10th. This is the hardest one of all. Profoundly love people. Now here's what's crazy. Less than 0.5% come here. Less than 0.5% come here. What that means is, in our country and in most of our churches, nearly 89% of the churches kind of work with it up to here to get people to Jesus. Hardly anybody deals with this. But you know what's really cool? Our Methodist tradition, and I'm going to have you put that slide up there, Mike. You've got to quote John Wesley. This is, called, this, this is where we live out our faith. John Wesley, um, the founder of Methodism, all the branches, he's the founder of it, but he said, sanctification is the grand depositum which God has logged with the people called Methodists. We don't ever say grand depositum. I know that, guys. But I've got I to quote the boy. He's, that's what he said. But the point is, he said, the most important thing God gave us, we have to do this because nobody else is doing it. It doesn't mean anybody else is doing it wrong. I'm not saying that. But we have been challenged to help people move through this. It's been our tradition. It's been our heart. It's been who we are as a faith. And it, truthfully, it's been part of all that we're doing. But i got to tell you, this is all about how do I live out my faith on a daily basis. This isn't about salvation. This is like on a daily basis, how do I do this? All right, guys, thank you. If you want to lay those down. Can you guys give them a big hand for that? I... I have been thinking a great deal about what happened at Asbury with the outpouring. I've been thinking a great deal about life as I've, we've been studying the Beatitudes and some other things coming together. And I want to, as we look at the Beatitudes, and I want to go ahead and go to that first slide, Mike, 5-1. I'm going to quickly read through the Beatitudes. We're not going to go in depth so much today. We're going to keep it up about 10,000 feet. But I want you to look at it from a perspective How do I live out my life? Now listen to this. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, this is Matthew 5, chapter 1 through 12. Let me pray. Father, open your word up to us that we may see. May we see you. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. So he's sitting down to teach His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. So he's sitting down talking not just to the 12, to all those who want to follow him. He's the king and he's teaching about how do I live in the kingdom. This isn't about heaven one day. This is right now. How do I live? How do we, you know, I can hear him in vernacular today. We'd say, Jesus saying, you want to follow me? Then let me tell you how you got to think. Let me tell you how you got to act. The whole Sermon on the Mount is that. It's about how do we live right now, earthy, very real in this world. And he starts by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. The very first thing, the most important thing we have to start with, I come empty. I don't, I I come bankrupt. I, I have to realize for me to live in the kingdom, I have to start by understanding 
all the junk I have, I set aside. All the education I have to, it's not unusable. It will be usable. But for him, he's saying, are you willing to make me king of your life? And come empty to me. That's what he's saying. Now go into that next slide. Blessed are those who mourn. He says, you want to think, you want to live out your life in my kingdom now? Do you mourn over your sin? And I don't mean you're, you're, you're at home all the time whining over it, but are you aware of the depth of your own sin, the depth of your own sin, but not just your own sin, the sin of the world around you? We have a God who hearts, whose heart breaks at sin. The violence, the cruelty, the, all of it. Are we willing to have our hearts break like that? That's what this is about. And he'll comfort us. Third, blessed are the meek. We, the meek is really easy. It, it, it's grace under pressure. It's very easy for me to, to respond. If I don't like what something's going on, I, have, I, can, I know how to make my, make my will known, okay? I'm waiting for an amen from my wife. Okay. But meekness at its heart in this context means I don't even have the right to, to get revenge. I don't have the right to have my will. I have a right to say, my king, whatever you want to do here, I'm going to trust you. This is right. The picture is, is of stallion, this big horse that's it's incredibly powerful, but has been trained to, to work and thus is under, under the master's control. That's exactly what the picture is here. Going on, blessed are, oh no, I'm sorry, I missed one, Mike, let me go back. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be filled. Do you hunger and thirst for anything? I, I've never hungered, I, I can't tell you I've ever hungered really deep, I've never really been hungry. I may have missed a few meals, but I, trust me, I wasn't that kind of hungry. I can remember one time in my life back in high school when I was part of a marching band and I had a, we had a kind of a crazy director who would take us on, we'd march for miles. And I still remember one really hot day. It was blistering hot and all I could think about was getting a drink of water. It occupied my mind. It occupied my, everything. I mean, I, I moved my feet so I would get back home to get a drink of water. What he's saying here, this is Jesus saying, you want to live in the king and kingdom now? Well, here's the attitude you've got to have. You've got to be so hungry and thirsty for me. And you will be filled. But not only will you be filled, you'll keep finding that you're hungry and he'll fill you again. And it's a crazy thing, but that's what it means. Now going on. Blessed are the merciful. I love that. Those full of mercy. And <clears throat> when you look at that, the whole idea of mercy, it's, it's one thing to say you have compassion on someone and Mercy means you have all the power, all the resources. The person comes to you doesn't deserve any help. They can't buy it from you. There's nothing they can do. In fact, they, they certainly, there's nothing about it that, that says they, just, they need it or I can even get it from you. But you choose to help them. That's mercy. Imagine a target. And there's love as the, you know, this love and all that good stuff. But the bullseye to me is mercy. But you realize that's how God treats us? Now, I came across something. Let's see if it works. Um, grace is getting what we do not deserve. Okay, grace is getting what I do not deserve. I don't deserve a pie for lunch. I probably won't get one. Oh, well, grace is getting what we do not deserve right? Justice is getting what we do deserve. But the one I want you to really hear is this one, mercy. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. We have a God that's full of mercy. I don't get what I deserve. 
He paid for my sins on that cross. He took my punishment on that cross. I don't get what I deserve. Blessed are the merciful. And because I have received mercy, I, my attitude should be like Jesus's. I offer mercy. If one thing, one attitude we should have as a church is mercy. Mercy should mark us. Because I have received mercy, I should offer mercy. Following mercy, I love this next one. Blessed are the pure in heart. A couple meanings for pure in heart. One is that it, it's moral purity, but that's not what it means here. Pure in heart means an undivided heart. We live in a time... I don't know about you, I have a thousand things going on around me all the time. Most of them are grandchildren, it seems. And, but I'm actually, let me, I'm kidding about that a bit. I mean, there's so much going on around me, I find that I have a divided heart. Why do we do singing at the beginning of our services? Is to help people, give them time to bring their, all their lives together so they can really focus on God. Many of you have gone to walk to a mass or the great banquet or or trace Diaz, whatever it is, some kind of spiritual retreat. It takes a long time for you can really drop everything down and focus, say, okay, I'm just going to focus on God for a while. It takes sometimes it takes a couple of days to get there. But look at what it says. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. By the way, do you realize the Beatitudes are promises? These aren't probabilities. These are promises. With an undivided heart, you will see God. You'll see God in nature. You'll see God in your family. You'll see God moving around you. You'll see God at your work, at your school. You'll begin to see things that other people don't see because they're not looking for God. I mean, this is an incredible thought. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. No, notice one thing it does not say. It does not say, blessed are those who live in peace with other people. It doesn't say that. It says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the ones that take the effort to step in and make peace. Sometimes that means you step in the middle <laughs> And try to bring peace. Often it means you're, the, you're, in that, you're in the fight. You're one of the two parties involved or multiple parties. And you have to choose how you're going to respond. For me personally, the Lord's dealt with me on this many times. I've had to understand I get to be the first one to extend a hand out. I have to be the first one to say I'm sorry. Even if it's not always my fault completely, you know. Am I willing to be a peacemaker? If, if I'm going to live, this is living out your life stuff now. If I'm going to live in his kingdom and be a king and representative, an ambassador of Jesus, do I live out my life like this? And then we go on next, Mike, we go to the, a couple different, the last two Beatitudes are about persecution. The first one is blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. In other words, People who try to live out their faith with these Beatitudes, these are not popular ways to live out life right now. And people are going to put you down. They're going to laugh at you. You may get a lot of hassle from work. It just, it, the worldview is so different. Remember, 57% of our world around us, if not more, are living in sin. And frankly, fairly comfortable with it. You're going to get some feet. You'll get some heat from that but if you live it out and the, the next one's the same way blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me well it's not just me living out my faith but it's also when I start talking about Jesus I'm gonna get in trouble people will put me down because they don't want to hear the way to heaven's exclusive. They don't want to hear that my way is not an okay way, that all roads want to lead to heaven. They don't want to hear that. And people will fight you on that. I want you to think about a couple things then with me. What's this all mean? When I went down to Asbury, 
the thing that hit me was two things. One was the very presence of God. But the second thing, which I haven't talked about, when I went were the hundreds, if not thousands of people over 40 that were looking for answers. Everybody I sat around were people at 50. I mean, this gray hair was the number one color up in the balcony, guys. These are people who've been Christians their whole life probably, and they're all come and say, is there more? I could, I could feel it. Not only that, look at our world today. People are talking. CNN's talking about this Asbury thing. Everybody else is talking about what's going on. But not only that, even in the entertainment industry. Have you, anybody seen the, the Jesus Revolution movie? Yeah. Like it or dislike it, it's about a group of people. You've got a group of hippies. You've got a group of very traditional, you know, really traditional church people. And God breaks out in the middle of them and say, how are you going to live? How are you going to live out your faith now? And if you go see the movie, don't be mad at the church people. Don't be mad at the hippies. Ask yourself this question. How do we live out our faith? See, that's the... Whoa. Um, Sorry, guys. The, The challenge of this is Jesus, through the Beatitudes, is saying, I expect you all to live out your life. Live out your faith on a daily basis. To live it out in such a way that your life is a witness for me. That you're going to be known for me. And it hit me as I was reading through the Beatitudes. And Julie and I have been studying the Beatitudes together. And we've been talking about it in our devotion. And it just hit me. What, how would the world be different if Christians, no matter what denomination, if we lived out the Beatitudes? Now, I can't live them on my own. I only can do that empowered by, by his presence, his spirit. But what, how would the world be different if we really practice this stuff. I can guarantee you in this church, we're gonna practice this stuff. Oh, we we wanna lead people to Christ. In fact, Jeremy's already told me we got four new baptisms and stuff, some youth, we got got a number of kids who are gonna be baptized because they're ready. But we're not gonna forget this group over here, you know, this big one at the end. We're gonna talk about, how do I move you from making a decision for Christ and, and help walk with you to you reach the goal of learning how to have a profound love of God. I mean, a profound love of God that will lead you to a profound love of people. I want to be like Jesus. And the challenge is, do you? Let's pray. Almighty God, as we come together, as we think about all this, as we consider all that you've done and are doing in our lives, Father, I'm amazed at how you're moving in our world right now. I really am. what, What makes me so aware is that most of the people around us still are in sin and they have never heard, or at least never been convicted. They don't see a different they're living in sin father god i pray first and foremost may we tell them the good news may we call them in a gracious way but may we call them to repent to to confess and that maybe there's more in the same way and oh father forgive us we also don't always hear the language we want to hear repent and confess they may not even know the words of what to say they may just say i know i've Sometimes people just say, I, I'm not right. I, I, I've lived my, my life some mess, and I need to figure out where I go from here. Lord, help us to hear with your ears. But also, Lord, I pray, don't leave us. I just come to you and making a decision for you. I pray, Lord, may we dare believe that you came to this earth so that we can live with you now. Every step. And experience what these Beatitudes are talking about. And experience the reality of your presence in such a way that our lives are transformed. Not just our lives, but the lives of all who we touch. Our families, our school friends, our, those we work with, those that we shop with, or whatever. Wherever we go, may we be a light in the darkness. 
all so that, Lord, may we have such a profound love of you that nothing can shake that. Because we know you are real and we know that you've brought us this far. And in the same way, Lord, with that kind of love, it's a fountain in me. May I learn to love people like you do. I mean, really love people. I don't mean being nice. I mean love people. All people. Not just the nice ones, but all people. And may we as a church model this for our neighbors. May we as individual live this out on a daily basis. Good and bad, hard and easy. May we dare believe, Lord, every day you're, you're pushing us forward to be with you because you love us that much. So, Lord, use us in this way. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.